Most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there, full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, gold and commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX, a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, Adaptive Asset Allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let Adaptive Asset Allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit RationalMF.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund. All right. Happy all right. Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Happy Friday. And uh, great to see you all again. And uh, actually enjoyed that that uh, little promo there. And I, I always love that we have to pause for so long on the legal disclaimers. But yeah, oh God, well, yeah, that was well, that's the most exciting time. part, isn't it? Absolutely. Am, I, am I missing Although something? I, I, whenever I show mine. So I, I was uh, I did a couple uh, events this week. I did. Uh, a high net worth event in Dallas. And then yesterday I did the Catholic crypto conference, which was very cool. And uh, whenever I pause on that, I'm like, you know, I have to show you this. It's, it's because in, in China, for every engineer we graduate in the United States, they graduate 35. For every lawyer they graduate, we graduate 40. They're a country of wealth creation. We're a country of wealth redistribution. So <clears throat> lots of lawyers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I remember the stat. Before, let's just ten years Rod, ago, something like before we what? jump in. Yeah, let's just remind everybody that uh, nothing we discussed today. Lest you leak gone. alpha accidentally, Rodrigo. Before we disclaim away it, exactly, exactly, uh, should not be construed as investment advice, and this conversation is for entertainment and information purposes only. Sorry, you're a good Rod, man. Go back. Richard, you're a good man. Excellent. I just remember more disclaimers. I oh, love yeah. it. No, that was separate. That was for, for the uh, the fun. This is this is for the podcast. Um, I remember the stat ten years ago was seventy five percent of the world's lawyers reside in the United States. Yeah, the most litigious nation in the world. Yeah, it's crazy. And and look, they're they're paid by the word, and uh, we all know the joke, right? What's forty lawyers on the bottom of the ocean? A good start, right? I got it. <laughs> but um, now look, they're, they're very useful, and uh, they're going to be busy. They're going to be busy with this oh, yeah. FTX debacle. There's no other word for it. Um, complete debacle. Uh, I mean, we can go as well, deep Well, Mark, as actually, that's, want. I mean, we've had, we've now had about 10 days or so to digest this. Um, how would you characterize this debacle now that you've had a chance to, to digest and ruminate and, and peel back the onion a little bit? Um, criminal activity. Okay, so that's that's first and foremost, completely criminal activity, uh, premeditated. Second, um, complete fabrication, um, and an intentional. Right? I mean, this was really? an intentional act uh, by a a group of people, and and I and my personal opinion. Right? And I've been tweeting about this. Uh, I believe SBF and, and Fair Caroline, Queen Caroline, as she was called today by Forbes, uh, are useful idiots. They are okay. not the brains 
<laughs> any way, shape, or form. Oh, I see. It. So neither SBF nor Caroline are the brains. Oh no, no, no. We're no, going. No, we're going no. beyond that because oh, I, the, the, okay. the um, charitable view of all of this is that the, this is a kind of, of a classic one mistake at a time, right? Like the Madoff was a real hedge fund manager, made a mistake, wanted to cover up, and said, "You know, I'll, I'll get, I'll get the money back," and then we're we're back in the good books. And you just never get there, right? So it, is there any aspect of this where you can say these were kids that were doing too much, too fast, willing to break things, willing to take the biggest and wildest, edgiest bets in order to grow their wealth with that, but, but thinking that they were going to do good and all nope. of this was... Nope. You actually, there's there's no part of that that maybe that comes into your Zero. equation. All right. Nope. So were the trades... Alameda were, were, was allegedly doing, not really taking place at all, the whole arbitrage yeah, across there, uh, different things. There were a few, right? You know, I, 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 I make the joke all the time that, you know, they call Madoff a hedge fund scandal. The only problem about it, there was no hedge and there was no fund. I mean, <laughs> literally, they had not made a trade in 13 years. Right. Just the think about that pyramid for a scheme. They had yep. not made a trade in 13 years. To Rodrigo's point, there there was a time when they were a real firm doing index arbitrage, but that ended. And I don't I don't believe in 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 the Madoff case that it was the accident. I mean, there's the story of. Uh, the big uh, money market fund that all the endowments were invested in 20 years ago where the guy was doing index arbitrage. And, you know, he got 495 of the 500 names short and lost, you know, 30 grand one day. Girlfriend runs the back off. He's like, just cover it up for me, honey. Tries to trade his way out of it. Two years go by, $130 million. Okay. Multiple audits. Think about this. People came in and audited the books for money, didn't find it. She hit it. Unfortunately, he broke up with her and she turned him in. And, you know, the university has all lost, lost money. That was exactly as Rodrigo described, right? Mistake, mistake, mistake. Made off bad guy, bad guy doing bad things. <clears throat> Maybe smart, probably a little bit smart. Um, masterful. I watched him once in action. The way he set up, kind of like I'm sitting here, you have the table in the corner. He would sit in the corner, three empty chairs at the Palm Beach Country Club. And in order to get into the club, a member had to bring you to the table. So one empty chair, three people. And while I'm having lunch this one day with, with some friends down there, this guy gets up from the table and says, don't you know who I am? You can't tell me I can't invest. He said, well, you asked to see, you know, our operation and that's just not allowed. You're out. And made this big and everybody's like, oh, ah, he just told that really rich guy that he can't come in and created this illusion of and his brother in law was literally when I say there was no hedge, no, no trades and no fund. Right. The brother in law was literally just transferring money into personal bank account. And. If you look at all the frauds, the big frauds in history, they're all family, right? They're all family relations because you can, you know, make people do stuff. And that's that's here, right? SBF and ex-girlfriend. And look, this is my opinion. And I I, I I don't have like insider knowledge on this, but it's my opinion. And I believe this since since minute one. Zero probability in my mind that those two children were the masterminds of this criminal enterprise. And but when I say criminal enterprise, take... I mean, if you look up the term money laundering mm -hmm. on Wikipedia, you'll see a picture that looks like the FTX network. I mean, uh, uh, you couldn't make this stuff up, right? Shell companies owned solely by SBF, loans, personal loans from Alameda to SBF, donations to uh, political parties, money from Ukraine into FTX, loaned to Alameda. I mean, the mind just blows with what actually, and the thing is in the old days, 
I'd come have lunch with y'all and I'd bring my, my briefcase and I'd leave it under the table and you'd say, Mark, Mark, you left. And you'd look as, oh, full of cash. Oh, oh, Mark. Okay, got it. Because <laughs> bag of money, not traceable. <clears throat> you do it all on chain? Are you joking? It's, it's observable. But what's the point of, of that and also becoming the, the, the most or the second most well-known public facing organization that look, I mean, that piece of software is pretty fantastic, right? And if you're a trader, yep. if you wanted to get the type of leverage that you needed, if you're, a, if you're producing any sort of Bitcoin or any sort of crypto where you need to hedge out your risk, you know, we need, you need kind of entities like that in order to be able to, to be useful. So he created something useful. So why, why, there's so many ways to do what you just described in crypto. Why make it that very powerful brand and then start buying things in the United States and so on? You know, I, I said in, in situations like this, um, questions are way more important than answers. You know, I or anybody else can spew an answer, you know, if we have, you know, but it's mostly, mostly opinion as opposed to fact. And there's very few people who really have the knowledge. And you know, what do they say? Um, knowledge is when you can give an answer. Um, genius is when you can ask good questions. And wisdom is we can ask good questions at the right time. And, and I think that that's kind of where we are is y y you do, you say, well, wait a second. If, if this was simply a money laundering enterprise to, you know, cleanse money going to foreign countries back into the U S and, and into political candidates pockets, there are other ways to do that. And, and a lot of other ways to do it where you, wouldn't necessarily get caught. Um, so why create this whole other thing? But the question of, were they actually doing the trading? It's coming out that they weren't. That Alameda was supposedly this big trading company wasn't. And it, it reminds me a little bit, and I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but um, you know, Bridgewater, arguably the largest hedge fund in the world, if if you were the largest hedge fund in the world, you would think you would have to be in the top five customers of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, all these firms, right? <clears throat> Just mathematically, that, that should be the case. But whenever I would go ask these people, hey, do, do you trade with these guys? I'm like, mm, not, not really. I'm like, how can you have a firm with hundreds of billions of dollars of equity levered multiple times in the futures market, not showing up. So that, that always worried me a little bit. And I think the same thing's true here is, um, you know, trading exchange arbitrage, cross-border exchange arbitrage, that's not rocket science. Anyone can do that. And But your point, there, there was some some good software and there were some real people using it. The part that's just so hard to fathom is how many legitimate organizations lent this other organization billions with an S on not much, it appears, diligence. I think that's actually just as big a story, Mark, is the names on the cap table are just remarkable. These are the who's who of VCs and growth investors and large pension funds. And it just defies belief to think that that not one of them conducted sufficient due diligence to uncover something suspicious that required further investigation. Well, you no, know, Tomas Polyhapatia had, I don't know if you saw the interview in the All In podcast, but he goes on about his team being asked for some money by FTX. And, and uh, he asks, he says, look, what we recommend that you do is, first of all, give us some more information of your data. Secondly, you know, we recommend that you put a board together. And once you get a board together, then we can, you know, maybe see about giving you some money. And the response from FTX was, go fuck yourself. Right. Like apparently verbatim. Yeah. Why don't you yeah. just go and fuck yourself? And, and the other thing, so that was, 
I, I'm not sure whether that is the epitome of institutional due diligence, right? But I, there is a company called Copper that is that is trying and attempting to be a custodian for in the crypto space, right? Yeah. So this idea of being responsible, making sure that you can trade uh, outside of the ecosystem so that your money doesn't get that, get caught. And they have these processes called Clear Loop and uh, Adam, Walled Gardens and the Walled Garden. And they have a list of all the crypto exchanges that have integrated with them. And at the time when I was looking at it, I, I thought it very odd that, uh, that out of all the exchanges, FTX would have was not integrated. Right. Uh, again, it's and great I, I guess Copper was asking some tough questions that FTX may not be have, may not have been willing to answer. Right? No, look, I mean, we we just got lucky. Right. I mean, we passed on this deal three times. Not because we're smart, just because we couldn't make the math just of the valuation work like the first round at eight billion where I think at the time revenues were 40 million or like on what planet? No. So we didn't even like I, I never met him. I mean, I'm, I've met pretty much most people in crypto and not, not every single person, but but a lot of people in crypto uh, been around a decent number of years, but never met him and clearly never met her. Because I'm confident in this after seeing the video and and the blog posts and the tweet, the Twitter stuff. Had I met that young woman, run. I, 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 I believe I would have run away. No chance. No I chance. Think VCs love that personality, though. No. You know? oh, yeah, there know. are people that do the idiot savant, we work. whatever. No, like. no, 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 no. No, that the interview she did where she was trying to explain the, you know, high school math or elementary school math. Nope, no, 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 no. But, but so, and you know, the, the last round at 32 billion was really a head scratcher, but that's the one that the, that the really smart people put a lot of money in. When was that? When was that raised? Uh, wait, November Earlier last this year? year, January this oh, year, something right. like so that. So this is like the peak of the mania where yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah, know peak, you, was, you really were like was, here's a term like sheet you have you have until tomorrow to say yes. Yeah. It was like right around the same time as the open sea 13 and a half billion where I was like what? And um, I remember some of the the guys calling me saying, "Hey, we'll sell you some of ours." In a second I'm like, "No." I mean <laughs> 50 cents on the dollar, 40 cents on the dollar? No, not at that value. Um, and actually 10 was the right number. 10 cents on that. But but here's the the weird thing. There are two there are two really weird things. I've been doing this a long time. That's just a nice way of saying I'm old. I mean, I'm old. And I've never and 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 this doesn't mean I've seen every transaction, but I've never seen and I've done I don't know, 300, 350 venture fund, buyout fund investments in my career, easy, probably more than that. Not once have I ever seen an individual commit <clears throat> hundreds, plural, of millions of dollars to a fund and then have that fund invest hundreds of millions in that company. Never seen that. Oh, I see what you mean. The SBF buying SBF a fund put and 500 then, million into yeah, yeah, a yeah. couple of the firms, including Sequoia. And yeah. then Sequoia, I shouldn't name names, but then they... I've just never seen that. And <clears throat> so that's one weird thing. But the second thing is it it, it does remind me, and, and we, we are, we, meaning, because I remember I was an allocator. I worked for Notre Dame. I worked for UNC. And I was part of this university, you know, group. And there was a, an example at the, uh, the 2000 period where there was this, um, and and I don't and again I don't mean this in a politically incorrect way, but it was a very attractive woman, just like Elizabeth, I guess today, said they don't put attractive people like me in jail. Like she actually said that during the deliberation on her sentence. Wow. So and and Elizabeth and Holmes people say Mark you're being shallow or you're being no 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 my point is that we all know attractive people rise right whether you're a model or a salesperson or a CEO, people who are tall do better than people. So th it's real. But my point was, she was an attractive woman. She was smart, well-educated. And Sutter Hill backed her. And basically, 
Yale assumed Harvard did the diligence and Harvard assumed Stanford did the diligence and Stanford assumed Duke did the diligence and we assumed and Duke assumed we did the diligence and we assumed Yale did the diligence. No one did the work. I mean, I mean, literally no one did the work. And when it crashed, we're all like, how did that happen? Like, well, because literally no one called a reference. I mean, did any work. And so there is a little bit of that that does happen. If someone you admire invests, you're like, oh, well, I want to be in that group. I want to be, I want to be the cool kids. And that FOMO stuff, plus, plus you had FOMO, right? It was the peak of the FOMO. And so the, the one that just kills me. And look, I, I actually like Mr. Wonderful. I mean, I actually think he's a decent guy. But the other day, you know, because he, he got in on the FOMO and, and someone asked him, well, would you back him again? And he kind of hemmed and hawed and said, yes. Ah, no, Kevin, you come on. You do not have to tell me about Kevin. I've seen him since this old fellow Canadians, right? I've seen him do this over and over again. I mean, my God. Yeah. My and God. so, look, I, I don't, I don't, I really don't understand because there, one, there wasn't any there there. So the, the whole thing about if you just went and asked for trade tickets, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have seen them. Um, but, but look, I didn't uncover it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I knew um, that it was, was a fraud. I, I, I will say the one thing I, I never did understand is because we have investment in other exchanges and I knew the, the cash flow of those exchanges. I, I, I don't understand, even if he is the second largest, that doesn't generate enough to pay $135 million for the naming rights of the stadium, right? I mean, it just doesn't. Or $40 million to, uh, to, uh, to Biden's campaign or to the Democratic right. Party. At, what, at the risk of asking you, you a leading a question, a Mark. Sorry, at the risk of asking you a leading question, Mark, uh, what do you make of the mainstream media's kind of softball uh Huh. Now, yeah, least. look, okay, you, you're gonna you're gonna story. make me do it, and and you know I'm, I'm gonna get grief about it, and and that's fine. Um, I will go yeah. there, uh, yeah. and you can you can pull me by the nose in here. Um, I actually do believe, and everybody says, Mark, you know, you're such a conspiracy theorist. You know, your tinfoil hat. I'm like guys, it's only a conspiracy theory if it isn't true. Okay. That's true about everything in life, right? It's only conspiracy theory if it isn't true. Truth is an absolute defense. So we learned that about COVID. We learned it about Madoff. We learned about all kinds of stuff. But so I, I will answer your question. <laughs> it's funny. My media, I had media training one time. And uh, I go in and he says, all right, here's something. So ask me a question. Start answering. He says, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? I'm just answering the question. He says, you never answer the question. You deflect and redirect and talk about what you want to talk about. Never, ever ask, answer a question. But I'm a dutiful firstborn, so I will answer your question. <laughs> so, What have you done to Mark, Richard? Welcome to All the right, club, go Mark. ahead. So <clears throat> I, I believe that uh, SBF and Caroline are useful idiots, Manchurian candidates, not with the chip, right? But, but useful idiots for uh, much smarter people, including his parents. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that his dad is a advisor to the regulatory agencies in the United States, graduated from Yale with all the Clinton mafia. I don't think it's a coincidence that his mom uh, leads the mysterious super PAC that the Silicon Valley VCs use to get around campaign finance laws. I don't think it's a coincidence that Caroline's father is the head of the economics department at MIT, where they both went to school. I don't think it's a coincidence that Gary Gensler worked for, you know, the guy at MIT uh, who was and then was appointed by Biden after SPF was the largest contributor personally to the Biden election campaign. I don't think those are coincidences. And so 
my my belief, and again, maybe I'll be proven wrong, but my belief is, you know, we, we live in a, we all live in this this world, and we're working in this world where there's been an innovation, blockchain technology, that has the potential, and I believe will, disrupt the traditional financial system. Right? The same way the internet disrupted media and commerce, I believe blockchain replaces trust with truth. We don't need trusted third parties to mediate the exchange of value in the future like we have for the last 800 plus years. Because of that, everyone always said, well, as soon as this becomes successful, then the government will just ban it. Turns out you can't ban a decentralized or distributed network, right? If you squeeze it here, it just pops up someplace else. So what can you do? A couple of things. Well, you could make it illegal, right? They tried that with gold in 1933. Um, and it was illegal in the United States from 1933 to 1975 to own gold. Now, people still owned gold, but it was technically illegal. And allowed them to go off the gold standard and convert to a fiat standard and destroy the value of the currency and make the rich people really, really rich and the poor people less rich through inflation, theft. Um, so you could do that. Or you could make the on-ramps and off-ramps illegal, like, like China kind of does with the internet, right? You're not allowed to have Google or Twitter unless you use a VPN. So you can't, you can't use the on-ramps or the off-ramps unless you kind of have a workaround. That's what I think kind of is happening here. So it, it appears that by systematically taking down the, the infrastructure, the lending infrastructure and the exchange infrastructure that allows people to, to move into digital assets and move money out of the traditional financial system. Because it, it's, I, I use this example of the Gandhi quote that I guess Gandhi didn't say, right? First they uh, ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So 09 to 15, first they ignore you. Eh, it's a nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money, teeny tiny, not meaningful, doesn't bother us. Then they laugh at you. 16 to 21, ha, 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 that's eh, a billion dollars, a couple of billion dollars, oh, it's a hundred billion dollars, ah, ha, ha, ha. Then they fight you. 2022, Bitcoin's a trillion dollar asset, whole industry is at three trillion, okay? Tens of billions of dollars are leaving the banks and going into these, you know, lending things, making 6% instead of zero. Time out. Now they fight you. So, 2022 to 2027, the then they fight you phase. That's a long time. And so my belief is that the FTX entity was created to do what it did, to discredit and cause, you know, cause doubt, um, sow the seeds of doubt, and also to depress price because in a you know part of the allure of crypto whether we like it or not is the number go up right that's what draws people to it is the fact that the market value kept going up well if you can depress that price to the level where people just yeah i'm done so that's a long answer richard yeah. to your question that again i'm i'm not i'm not accusing any particular person or persons, I'm simply saying, it seems odd to me, it seems odd that the firm was founded eight days after, you know, the guy who was the, 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 the person who was elected based on the person who was the largest donor to that person. Eight days later, they formed this firm. It seems odd to me that so much money that was coming out of governments, I mean, WEF and FTX, I mean, they've taken it down on the website now, but FTX sponsored WEF. SBF was up there in his gym shorts yeah. and t-shirt with Clinton yeah. and 
the thing with all this is that like a good a good story and a good conspiracy theory is full of coincidences. So it is. It could sure. just. It could well be. You know, I t- I try to. I have. A, I just have a hard time thinking that something that complex and that abstract was coordinated by any one thing or not. In fact, when I when I see a lot of this, I think that the uh, the, the vein of the of this theory that you expounded could be in lockstep, but kind of coincidental. Sure. Right? For, for example, SBF, how he was raised, what his values were, what he believed to be important in life, possibly power rather than money and money leading to power. And how do you maximize your opportunity sets in one lifetime? What do you do? You know, how much, how do you, how, what type of bets are you going to play? So you're going to play the edge. You're going to play, do a full Kelly criterion and betting uh, approach yep. in order to maximize that, that belief system and the people that you've known your whole life and, and, and try to, if you want to influence the system, that's the only way to do it. And it kind of, I can see that happening where he, he actually went for it and it worked for him in sure. a dispassionate way where he's playing the ESG language because he knows that that's what that's that's the game but ultimately what he wants to create is enough value for him to to be powerful enough to to get government to do what what is right for FTX so he can continue his special motion machine right so I, and then everything that you said as kind of like a Everybody else nudging them in the right direction, or like, and, and, and without a central Look, I, I, that's just, I said, that's as close as I can get to that. That like, a hundred percent agree with you. That said, I don't have any special knowledge. I'm observing fact patterns. I'm observing flows of capital. Again, they did it on chain, so it's you know actually easy to analyze, uh, as opposed to sacks of money under the table. But I think I think your point is is well taken. But I, I have the same problem, and again, this can make me unpopular with a whole bunch of people. I have the same problem with with that argument that I do when people say, "Oh, Trump's playing 4D chess," and the rest of y'all are just too stupid to understand it. Like, not, I, I don't see it, right? I, I just don't. So I've listened to Sam in hours and hours of interviews. I've I've watched his actions on the internet and his engagement with people. And like you say, the, you know, F off to the, yeah, I, I, I've seen all, and, and I look at that and, and the flip side is Mark, he went to MIT. You didn't truth, truth. He did go to MIT, but did he go to MIT because of this or because mom and dad are really well connected? I don't know. I, I don't, but, I have a hard time believing that this guy that I, I don't know if you've seen the recent video of, of him where he's holding the hundred dollar bill and, you know, showing his Toyota Corolla. I, I watched that and no way I'm thinking mastermind, hmm. just no way, but you what absolutely. Was a lot of those PCs. Right. What was that trend? Pardon? That was shared, the transcript that was shared about uh, meeting with SBF and everybody's like, I'm 100%, I'm a 10 out of 10 on this guy because he's such a yeah. genius. So other people look, where do we go? that way. Where, where do we go, Mark? I mean, in a, couple of different, in a couple of different ways, right? So you've got all these uh, top drawer growth allocators, VCs and institutions who utterly failed at basic due diligence yeah. in their role as fiduciaries and capital allocators. What does that say to end investors and, and how does that slow the gears of, you know, allocation going forward, right? What new processes and checks and balances are going to be added to the, the, the list as people with money, go to allocators and trust them with the allocation of their capital. That's the first Oh, Adam, I mean, such, again, such brilliant, brilliant insight. And that, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly the issue, right? Is it's, it's like the, you know, the, the, the snail crawling up the pole, you know, crawls up three and then slides down two at night. He's still making progress, but geez, if you backslide, I feel like this backslides us four, right? So we lost, yeah. you know, two whole days of, of process progress because, Financial services is all about trust, right? 
Yeah, this is like a you had one job situation. Yes, right? <laughs> yes. And and look, you know, do bad people do bad things? Yes. Do bad people who are really smart do really bad things? Oh, yeah. In fact, if you think about, I can't remember the three things, but it's like competence. Yeah, it's competence. Uh, it's, it's like technical skill, competence, and integrity. And the worst possible combination is someone with like intelligence, technical competence, but no integrity. Like most dangerous person on the planet. And Howard Marks used to talk about this in our world. And he says, you know, the problem is when you're trying to allocate capital, you have to decide between the good person who sounds good and the bad person who sounds good because they don't want the people who sound bad make the presentation. And so, yes, this definitely sets back adoption, embracing the industry. It also probably sets back just some of the firms, you know, self-inflicted wound. But I, I, I struggle with, with laying all the blame on them because fraud happens. People, they, they maybe showed a balance sheet. It's possible, right? The Sequoia went in there and they showed them a balance sheet that footed, that footed, foot, um, and looked, looked normal. Now, could you have said, well, I need to see the trade tickets or I need to see, you know, uh, the bank balance or whatever. It's, it's kind of like, you know, we have this investment in this company called Figure Technologies, blockchain company, and they bank home equity lines of credit. In the old days, what'd you do? You filled out a paper application and you could lie your ass off, right? You can make up all kinds of stuff. You give that paper application, the person, the human being reads it and says, oh, that looks trustworthy. And maybe, maybe they'd ask you for a pay stub, which you could forge that too if you wanted to. But that was about it. And people got their loan and some people defaulted, some people didn't. What does Figure do? They literally, using Plaid, go into your bank account and look. Are you getting paid every two weeks? Who is paying you? How much is going out every month? And they do the calculation. And in five minutes, you're either up or down. Okay, that's superior. And there was a there was an instance. I don't know if you remember this uh, global financial crisis. There was this hedge fund that was basically doing trade financing, and there was this big firm, public company up in in Minnesota that supposedly uh, was funding Best Buy and, and Target and basically helping them buy computers and, and other gizmos. And all these hedge funds put money in it. And it was a goose egg. Because literally, this guy who was a pillar of the Minneapolis community, like won all kinds of awards and you know, man of the people, had a woman in a warehouse who printed out on a dot matrix printer fake invoices from Walmart and Target. And for eight years, billions of dollars, just fake. And so should anybody have caught that? Sure. But how did you, the only way to catch it, because you looked at the invoice and it looked like a real invoice, but you had to know the difference between the type of paper or the ink or I, I don't no, know. No, Mark, and I, I'm sympathetic of people making mistakes and, and I, and I understand the momentum of FOMO and, and I, I can get behind a lot of that. What really strikes me is just the, just the number of, of reputable yeah. no, institutions. I, I don't, I don't have an answer for you. On that. I, and I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not asking for you to give an answer, but I, I can't help, but think that this doesn't just set back investment in the digital asset space, but it just sets back investment in growth and innovation and tech in general, right? Because it all these are all institutions that are that had been well known for being writing the biggest tickets yeah. and recognizing the the up and comers in all in Silicon Valley and and crypto and and that whole spectrum of growth assets. It's not, it's not the first time, and it won't be the last time, unfortunately. Sure. Pets.com. Pets.com. I right. was there. You and I big were there. I get guy, it. Big black guy. <laughs> real smart people put money in that, wiped it out. 
You well, know, um, look, we work, we work with I, Adam we work, Newman, yeah. right? And not only what's crazy about that story is that he blows up. He, first of all, he's a, he's a, the same type of guy walks into a boardroom, says some words, impresses the board, no due diligence necessary. That's the type of founder that, that's going to win. And if you're in the game of investing in a hundred things, knowing that only 10 of those are going to actually be unicorns then it really doesn't matter. You've seen the unicorns in the past. They have that personality type. That's what we're going to invest in. So much so that Newman, you know, there's a Netflix documentary that comes out, or a documentary film, mockumentary film that comes out. And then three months later, he raises a new venture and they all give him money again. But okay, right? here's the difference. Here's the difference. I actually have met Newman. And I hate to say this. I would back him. He is smart. He is, he is charismatic, charming, attractive, but oh, he is smart. Yeah. And, and in WeWork, he made a mistake, right? By thinking that you could turn a bricks and mortar business into a tech company, okay? You can't, it's still bricks and mortar. And leverage always will kill a real estate business if you get over leverage. leverage that, that resets in short order. Yeah. So and and so there's a difference yeah. between megalomania and Ponzi scheme, right? I think that exactly. And and so, and I don't believe it's, it's it was still poorly managed, right? Oh, Ultimately oh, it's, it's oh, 100 poor incredibly poorly managed. But yeah. that is that's a tragic flaw of a really, really smart narcissistic person. Right? And really, really that's smart narcissistic right people get burned that way, right? They right. think they're invincible. They think, oh, they'll be able to talk their way out of it. And that's, a, <laughs> that's the one thing with, with FBF, like get off the internet, dude, stop talking. I mean, he's getting bad legal advice. Either that or he's completely immune because he's got so many friends in low places that, you know, he's feeling, he's feeling so smug, but, you know, but, and, and Newman's new idea is actually, a, a not, again, it's a good idea. And so that one is okay with me. Like Theranos, she's a liar. Right. I mean, she, she lied, right? There was no one drop blood. It was all fake, 100%. And with, with Alameda, fake, just fake. So I... I, I, I do, do we agree. know that for a fact, Mark, do, do, do we know for a fact that the, the trades were not taking place at yeah, all? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what, what, we, what we know is there's $600 million of assets and 10 billion of liabilities. So that that's what I mean by fake. I mean, it, it, it's kind of like with three arrows capital, right? They told everybody they had more equity than they did. So they got 6 billion of loans on 2 billion of equity. That's just fraud, right? That's you, they're lying. They're they're liars. And Adam Newman didn't lie. He just overextended, and and it came collapsing down. I mean, I remember he invented community adjusted EBITDA. I'm like, well, what is what is that? What is that, Adam? Well, yeah, no, no an abundance. I think where you're going is an abundance of hubris is not fraud, right? Like, right. But but this, and and to your point, Adam. The people I blame there were the people that bought it, right? He got up and said, community adjusted EBITDA. Well, what's that? Well, all the money we're spending on our buildings and maintenance to build the community isn't really an expense. It's an investment. Like, Intangible assets. No, 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 it's not. It's, and and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's as crazy as you know shopify and all these tech companies absolutely market cap per click compensation yeah stock based yeah. compensation is revenue somehow like <laughs> on what planet is paying people money revenue well in in this generally accepted accepted counting principle like no and so the fact that they're down 90 and 95 percent shouldn't surprise people but it does and so what I think is always interesting in these situations is it's a kid, right? The emperor has no clothes. All the adults are like, oh, look at those beautiful clothes. 
And the kid's like, the dude's naked. I mean, and I don't want to see that. And I'm sorry to put the SPF image of naked in your brain for the weekend. I'm sorry. I hadn't until you asked me. To I know. I, and I don't, I, I can't unsee it. Right. And, <laughs> but here's, look, Rodrigo, I want, I want you to be right. I don't want to be right. I don't want this to be a government controlled hit on an industry that I care about, that I believe is the future of financial service, that I believe does make mankind better. I don't want that to be the case. I mean, I really don't. But I, I just have such a hard time when I look at the players and when you read the report from the you know Enron guy, or he wasn't an Enron guy. He's the guy that came in to clean up the Enron mess. And now he's come in to clean up this mess. And he says, look, this is worse in terms of controls or lack thereof and fraud than Enron. I'm like, okay, well, that, that argues that either they're incompetent, which I'm pretty sure they were, or they're evil, which there's no, we can't be sure yet. We can't be sure yet. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty clear they're incompetent, right? I mean, well, they, they, yeah. they don't need to be evil. They could just be sociopathic. Sociopathic. Not really yeah. care. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah, and, that, what we're and talking that's what about with I don't want that to be true. Like, cause I, I lived through it in this summer. So we're investors in BlockFi and BlockFi suddenly is under attack. Well, let's 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 do the let's do the whole sequence of events, because people forget this part. The FTX bid for BlockFi was not the first one. This goes back all the way to May fifteenth, actually to May 9th, my birthday of all days. May 9th, Luna collapses. Okay, everybody freaking out. Now, who did the Luna attack? Because we know exactly how it happened. Someone had to go short two bills of Bitcoin against the four bill collateral fund that was backing the, the peg in the algorithmic stable coin, like military intelligence, oxymoron. And so sequence of events that caused this thing to collapse. You know, people accused Citadel, they accused JP Morgan, BlackRock, they all denied it. Someone did it. I'm not saying who, but someone did it. Someone made that attack. Turns out Alameda lost a shit ton of money on that collapse. Okay. Super leveraged into that trade. That's when most people think it became insolvent. Exactly. So, so, so then what happens next? He goes to Celsius who he owes a lot of money and says, I'll rescue you. And they're like, Oh, awesome. Here, look at the balance sheet. Oh, shit. No. Okay, we, we don't have enough money to rescue you. No, he he's a bad guy. Everyone, look at Alex. Look at Alex. Look at Alex. Amazing job making Alex the criminal. Okay. <clears throat> then a month later, middle of June, BlockFi, minding their own business. They've settled with the SEC. Everything's going fine. And this stupid little anonymous Twitter account, Otteru, which had systematically exposed Celsius, leaked confidential documents that you could not have unless you were in their data room. Who was in the data room? Sam. Hmm. So is there a link? I don't know. So this Otteru guy leaks documents that you could only have if you're in the BlockFi data room on Thursday. So the way it went down is Tuesday, three arrows defaults. Okay. Celsius that morning, that was Tuesday, Singapore time, Tuesday morning, um, <clears throat> no, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, Celsius closes the doors. Up until that point, money was flowing out of Celsius into BlockFi. Because people were like, Celsius bad, BlockFi still okay. Celsius closed their doors. Now it's a bank run. 
right? As soon as you close the doors, it's like, it's a wonderful life. Don't close yep. your doors. You won't reopen. Okay. Mama dollar, Papa dollar, the whole thing. So we're trying to raise this, this equity and we get to Thursday night and this fucker, Otteru, releases this document showing that the collateral backing the Three Arrows Capital loan, because people forget Celsius lost a bunch of money to Three Arrows. Voyager, ton of money to Three Arrows. BlockFi got it all. They were over collateralized. But a piece of the collateral is GBTC. And they released that. And in 12 hours, the spread went from 23, the discount went from 23 to 34, and the price fell 50%. So it just blew and, you know, call it a $100 million hole in the balance sheet. So the largest investor in the syndicate Friday morning pulls out. What are you doing? You have $300 million in this company. What are you thinking? Like, we're out. So now I'm scrambling to, to find other investors. Sam magically shows up over the Father's Day weekend and says, I'll give you this line of credit. Ugh, one little caveat. I get to buy the company for nothing. Literally nothing. Why? Why did he do that? Because he owed him $700 million that he couldn't pay because it was all fake. Same thing at Voyager. And so now you start going, whoa, 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 wait a second. The trigger was the losses at Luna. He owes all these lenders money that he doesn't have because it's been stolen. So I'll just, I'll just pretend that I can buy them with money that I don't have. I'll just steal it from you know, customer assets because no one's actually looking at the books. And he almost got away with it. Think about this. He almost got away with it. And what took him down? CG. Hubris. He tries to get this law through, passed. And then, look, this has been going on forever, right? Do you know why we all have mutual funds in our 401ks? Because BlackRock and Vanguard wrote the law. They literally sit on the committee that wrote the law in the Tax Act of 86 that when we went from defined benefit to defined contribution. And but for Mooch, it would be worse. They wrote another law, remember the Fiduciary Act, right, when Trump got elected? Yep. That Mooch got killed in his 11 days in office. And, and that was going to mandate, <clears throat> unless you put the money in the lowest fee, meaning ETF, you were not a good fiduciary. I remember. Yep. Yeah. Who wrote the law? The guy from BlackRock and the guy from Vanguard. I mean, like, those who stand to benefit the most. From of course. that, the but execution they actually of that sit exact on the committee law. writing the law yeah. because they yeah. pay the most money. So, yeah. so here's here's the thing, Sam. You caught me in the conspiracy theory. I really believe in. Good yeah. on you, Mark. Eventually, you're gonna catch me. You got me. I know. So here's the thing. It's always follow the money, right? I, I tell the story all the time. 2014, Exxon Mobil made 40 billion dollars. That's when oil prices really high, right before they collapsed. The corporate rate was still 40 percent back then. So what should they have paid? 16 bill. What did they pay? Zero problem. Minus 1.7. They got a $1.7 billion tax refund. How? They were the largest lobbyist firm that year. They paid $327 million and turned it into 17.7 .7 billion. I would do that all day long. That is a great investment. So so one day I'll, I'll give you the inside information on what happens at the Canadian banks, and then you'll be really excited. Oh, God. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that, I, I, is, yeah. That, that one is, again, well, that's yeah. when conspiracy I, I, theories I, I just, turn into factual reality. But, but, but real quick on this. So Sam's trying to get this, this bill passed that basically would make FTX legal and DeFi illegal. Okay, just let that sink in for a second, because... Even in all of this, it wasn't the technology that broke. It wasn't the promise of blockchain and decentralization that broke. It was the CFI version of TradFi that broke because trust was violated 
and we had a run on the bank, right? History is replete with lots of those examples. So what happens in trying to get that law passed? He said some bad stuff about Binance and CZ. And here's the crazy part. I like about CZ's kids. Like, what? Why would you do that? Because the world in which we live, you can't say anything without it getting back to that other person. <clears throat> so it gets back to CZ that you're dissing on my family, man. And so what does he do? He outs him. And had it not been for that event, had CZ not outed him. Yeah, he wanted to give him a little slap in the hand. Uh, I don't know if he wanted to end him. No, 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 no. I, I don't think, I don't even think CZ knew the extent of the and, fraud. Yeah, I don't either, no. And, you know, there's but a whole bunch of the other thing that no, happened? He didn't, didn't knew Caroline about say what the... stuff and he was trying to out that? Nah, maybe. I think it was simply, I own half a billy of FTT. There's only a couple billy free float and you have five. So I own you still, even though I sold, uh, even I sold you the business, I still own you. And, he, and, and look, he threatened, Caroline countered, and it was over in 12 hours. Yeah. Well, I think Mike Harris asked the question, right? Is the government attacking these firms or are they attacking each other for domination, right? I think right? the narrative that you're proposing here is yeah. that this is, you know, cannibalization within the industry, right? They're just fighting one another for, for monopoly power. And now Binance is one step closer, right? I wanted to ask, a, because yeah. we're, we're running up on an hour here, Mark. And, and, and one question that's been sort of nagging at me is, I've always sort of thought about the crypto ecosystem as a little bit like the euro dollar system. Um, yeah. Great. Where you've got this kind of high powered collateral, but it's a very small fraction of the total size of the of the ecosystem, right? And you've got so you've got some small amount of real US money in the euro dollar system that is available via swap lines from the US Fed and it collateralized trillions and trillions of dollars of <laughs> of euro dollar loans yep. that are kind of backed by this um, network of cross guarantees from all these foreign banks, right? Yep. Um, and so if, if one of those banks fails and it's revealed that, you know, that they actually don't have access to that high powered money or there's not nearly enough high powered money in order to, to support the, the system in general, then the whole thing kind of comes down. What is the high powered money in the digital asset space? And like, as I look across the sort of the Binance's of this world and, and, and um, the entities that kind of facilitate lending and support um, the business or commercial orientation of the ecosystem, what is the, what is the high powered money? And, and what are some of the indicators? Like in the, in the, in the TradFi space, you look at the, the, it used to be the TED spread or, you know, yep. like the yeah, TED spread, yep. OIS spread or whatever, right? Like there's, there's indicate, what are some of the indicators in the, in the, in the digital asset space? And what am I missing about my analogy between the digital asset space and the Euro dollar system? That maybe no, it's, can... it's, it's actually, it's actually a really cool analogy and I like it a lot. I think that the only, I wouldn't say it's missing. It's a timing issue. I, I think, I think, it's the eventuality, but it's still very nascent. And so, you know, I always talk about, you know, Bitcoin is kind of like the base layer of the future of money. You know, money, an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. That's gold. Gold is the base layer of the global monetary system. Even though we're off the gold standard, the central banks still own it. It still is the base monetary. And then on top of it, we introduce currencies backed by government debt and then banking credit, right? As, as JP Morgan said, right? Gold is money. Everything else is just credit. And then we have the fraction reserve system, which, you know, you got all the maxis and all these people like, oh, that's evil. You know, it's a fraud. I'm like, stop. Name a country 
with a lousy or non-existent fractional reserve banking system that you would live in. I will wait. And no one <laughs> has been able to give me an answer for that, right? Uh -huh. Because the difference between no growth countries and growth countries, I believe, is fractional reserve banking. Because you allow the collection of the monetary assets to then be utilized more because savers lend their assets to borrowers and builders and growers. For productive means is a key part here, which is yes. what I want to get to in the ecosystem. Of and the banking exactly. system can breathe. And so, yeah. and so, but, and, and where Rodrigo's going is exactly where I want to go and why I think it's just, it's the nascence of this. We skipped that part. We went right to zero cost trading and big leverage and I tell, I, I shouldn't out my brother, but I, I tell the story. He's like, he called me up and he says, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I has a BitMEX and I'm like, stop. You levered up your Bitcoin, right? 50 times, whatever you levered it up, got a margin call. You didn't make the margin call and they seized the collateral. That is not stealing. Now, in hindsight, someone told me, well, that was their business plan. Right? Entice people to over lever and then steal. It. I'm like, oh, shit. OK, that is theft. But they didn't really steal it. You're an idiot for levering. So to Rodrigo's point, levering trading sardines is not productive. Building exchanges, lending institutions, like if I have Bitcoin that I'm saving and I want to save outside the fiat system so the government can't devalue my my savings but i want to use that to let somebody borrow against it to build a restaurant or a widget company or or new software that's productive but using it to speculate on exchange arbitrage it's fine produces a few jobs but it's not really productive and the financialization to me happened too fast. It's like we did a thing uh, with a partner and, and we created an index fund. I'm like, no, it's too early. You know, index funds took 90 years to become a thing, right? They were invented 90 years ago and then they became, well, I guess it took 70 years. In the last 20 years, they became a thing. It was all about active management of stocks and it was about, you know, saving and accumulating wealth and, and putting that wealth in the institution that we call finance and then using it to build other companies and people would borrow against their homes and they'd borrow against their their stocks and and there was real growth and and the really smart people like Tomasic and GIC which unfortunately invested in FTX they one upped us all, right? They took their government obligations and turned entitlements that were a net negative into a positive by investing them in innovation and growing the assets so they exceed their liabilities. Like the one thing I agreed with W, I, and I didn't like him. I like him now. I think he's a cool guy, but I didn't like him as a president. But the one thing I agreed with, he's like, we should invest, you know, Social Security and stock market. Now, his timing was bad, but the idea is absolutely certain, right? If you've got a long time horizon, it shouldn't be in cash or bonds. It should be in equities. In fact, my, my little pet peeve, and this is way off of topic what you asked the question, is in 401ks, for me, it should be illegal, like literally illegal for kids 25 until they turn 65 to own bonds. It should all be in real estate, venture capital, equities, growth assets, because those assets can't be touched until they turn 71 and a half or whatever. So the bond, the reason they're in bonds is because the insurance companies take 4% on the GICs and the mutual fund companies take 1%. And it's like, that's just a grift. So I don't think we're the euro dollar system. <laughs> and to your point, why did we bail out all the banks? Because that would have gone like that. And that's. You're muted, Adam. I think you're muted or your audio is gone. Yeah. Adam, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Uh, your battery must be dead. Um, so, 
you, you just come into the conversation when you're uh, when you're ready to go at them. Uh, yeah, because the interesting thing about the euro dollar is that eventually the Fed did come in and save it, right? I don't yeah. think anybody's yeah, yeah. coming in to save crypto at any point. No, <laughs> and look, I mean, CZ much of the to, contrary, you know, raise right? The, with the bailout guys. fund, which look, it. I struggle with the um, us and them, you know, TradFi, DeFi, you know, Bitcoin only, and there's no room for CFI. I think there is room for CFI. I think it's a transitional mechanism to get those people who are not comfortable with the risks of a pure DeFi and self-sovereign, you know, self-custody. Because look, there's risk in custodying your own Bitcoin. You could send it to the wrong address. You could forget your seed phrase. You could have someone you come into your house. kidnapped and, and dismembered. Or yeah, one, somebody I mean, from your family could, which, which, by the way, are things that I know of people that were threatened by. <laughs> so oh, it is of course. A, it Bear is a assets thing. are a very scary thing. Ask Hans mm -hmm. Gruber, right? It's almost Christmas time. Die Hard's going to be on. <laughs> and... I mean, bear assets have risks. And so there are, there's a role for, sure. for CFI and vilifying it. And the other one I don't get, this is the one I really don't get, is the maxis are like, get your Bitcoin off exchanges so we can get price discovery. I'm like, what? If everyone puts their Bitcoin on a treasure or a ledger, preferably a ledger since I own a piece of it, and they put it in the backyard, there is no yeah, price. You're, you're exchanging your crypto in a, in a random Starbucks. <laughs> Nobody yeah. knows that's how you get your yeah. money. And, you know, no. big wrench risk. But but if there's no trading, then there's no price discovery at all. And and I heard one guy say, no, no, no. What we want to do is get the free float really low. So then the price moon. Like, oh, my God, you just. Well, that's what I mean. Like, this is, so that, look, that was FTX. Those are the same like coins. So, so look, we just had the we're in the Cayman Islands, Adam and I, we just had the Real Vision um, conference at Mark. You were supposed to be. Uh, at. I, I showed yeah, up at the so lunch. Embarrassing. You never came supposed up to be there. And I changed bags and my passport didn't get into the new bag. And I got halfway there and no passport. No ticky, no yeah. washi. So I didn't get yeah. to, to. A lot of Americans, I heard, I had this conversation with a lot of Americans. Like I, I barely made it. I had to go back and grab my passport to get back in because I, I never travel outside of the country. And for some reason, they thought Cayman was in the U.S. Um, but look, the, the, the what was interesting about the group is I would say half was traditional finance. The other half was crypto. But I and, and there were, as always, right, with, with thoughtful, creative, intelligent people trying to build something new in a new frontier market, there was a lot of interesting projects. But yeah. I would say the balance of people there were, were literally just talking about breakouts and trading and, and charting. Right. Like, where crypto in their mind was the best casino to be in. Right. And we're talking about, like, I'm, you know, we're, we're trying to sell our services, right? We're trying yeah. to sell all weather, all, all terrain strategy that can deal with multiple investment scenarios. And you, Mr. Crypto, have seen the pain of that. But you got out, a couple, a bunch of them said, like, oh, I knew enough. I've seen enough bear markets to get some cash on the sidelines, but I'm waiting for that 10x next week. Yeah, right? It's not a, a, for the most people right now in this ecosystem, it is about the casino. It is not about the projects. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that that's our end away. Of as a venture capitalist, that's really hard for me because you know 80% of what we do is the equity in the companies building out the infrastructure. And and only 20% is actually the protocols, but we don't trade them. We own them. Now we, and that's not fair. We do have a product called risk managed Bitcoin and it owns Bitcoin in an uptrend and owns cash in a downtrend. Simple trend following model like an old CTA. And all it tries to do is take the vol from 80 to 40 and it's worked right you know over the three plus years we're running it you know bitcoin's down 30 we're up 70. now when the bitcoin was mooning we'd lag because you know you're not gonna you're not always gonna be in the market but it's 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 just a cta's worked really really well for 20 plus years before decimalization and ken griffin and high frequency and jim simons basically took all that alpha and now the average person could never run a CTA or a trend following model because it doesn't work. But in crypto, still run by humans, greed, fear, emotion, too many people looking at charts, it does. 
But that's, that's just a little tiny piece of what we do. What the core is trying to build and trying to build this infrastructure of the new financial system. Like it, it's crazy that you can't get your money on a weekend, that you, you know, the market's closed more hours than it's open, that things don't settle T instant. They settle T plus two or T plus 30 if you're a bank loan. Yeah. And Fedwire, 70 year old tech, you know, ACH. You have to walk Logan. into your bank to in order to wire something. I don't like know, that. Mark. So, as the CIO of a futures trading firm, I kind of am glad nah. that you're <laughs> trading over the weekend. You know, like the, at know, least look, the guy I, can rest. I got it's you. God's I know. I, 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 amen to, to time off. I, I'm, I'm a big fan. But ultimately, um, I really do believe, you know, blockchains are the only tech capable of managing hundreds of billions of connected devices in the future and that, that financial networks will, will need them. But then it has to be about building. It has to be about slow and steady, not casinos. And it has to be a, as a diversifier, right? I mean, what I love about what you guys do is, is you're, you're focusing on discipline, right? We have a model and we follow a discipline and we're not, we're, we're trying to remove the emotion. I mean, you are trying to remove the emotion. Yeah. In fact, right. I worked the first firm I worked for, right? Disciplined investment advisors. We had a brown coffee mug and it said, invest without emotion. And it was awesome, right? That's what we did. Now, people say, ah, it's boring. I'm like, well, yeah, but boring is beautiful over the long term because compounding is, is what matters. And, you know, I had, I had this, this very cool experience yesterday, just a little uh, kind of some uplifting stuff uh, instead of all the downer stuff we're talking about with FTX. So I was in a lift on the way to uh, the airport in Philly and come from this Catholic crypto conference. And my driver says, do you mind if I listen to a podcast? I'm like, no, go ahead. And she pulls up Preston Pish's Investor's Podcast. <laughs> it's my favorite, Preston. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm episode 265. She says, what, you're kidding me. And this young woman grew up in the wrong side of Philly. Not from means, I mean, she's like, look, I'm working my, my nine to five job. I drive Lyft at nights because I'm saving up because I want to invest. And I want to get, you know, compounding working for me. And I want to learn about crypto. I'm like, oh my God, yes. I mean, yes, that's what this is all about. And what you guys do is, is the tool for investors like her. They don't have time. She's not going to become an expert in stocks and bonds and commodities and currencies and crypto, but she's trying. And I just, I was inspired by her. It was, it was yeah, just a very cool. cool 45 So Mark, I'd love to hear actually in, in the last 10 or 12 minutes or whatever that we have with you, what are some really neat projects that where you're actually building amazing tech that you think is going to, you know, to, to take jobs as a uh, phrase, put yeah. a dent in the universe, yeah, yeah. you know, like what, what's some cool stuff you're working oh, on that. One of my really favorites, do? right. And you know, he's my, my favorite CEO. Cause the, the man is an animal. I mean, I mean that in the most positive loving way. Um, Mike Cagney runs a firm called figure technologies. Talked about him earlier. And they, they do two things. One, they, they make home equity lines of credit loans uh, on the chain, on blockchain. So first, you know, originated loans on chain. They also do some mortgages on chain, but, but their big businesses is home equity lines of credit. Um, that business is booming, obviously, because no one can get a mortgage anymore because mortgage rate doubled. So they're going to improve their homes. So they, they tap on the equity of the house. But, you know, they'll tell you in five minutes if you're approved, you know, get your money in five days, doesn't take six months, no paper, zero paper, and all of it's done on chain. And so that's one of their businesses. But the other business that I really love and and I think is is amazing tech, but it's, it's got some work to do. Um, most people don't think about it, but every stock and bond traded in the U.S., uh, sits literally physical piece of paper sit in file drawers in dallas texas at a place called dtcc mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they trade this is a crazy number 1.8 quadrillion dollars a year of volume it's a little 
like a mutual insurance company owned, owned by the banks and they actually make some nice coin off it. But long story short, why are we using 400 year old technology paper? Oh, it's not paper. It's electronic. It's Q-SIPs. It's ones in, you know, little alphanumerics. I'm like, yeah, but the paper's still there. And the Q-SIPs aren't really ours, right? If I have a stock in my brokerage account, it's the broker's. It's in the broker name, not in my name. Mm-hmm. So they created something called provenance blockchain that wants to replace DTCC. But it's a problem about the lemonade stand, right? If you put the lemonade stand, even if you have great lemonade, if nobody drives by, nothing to do. So the challenge is to get people to come to their marketplace and digitize or tokenize assets. And ultimately, could it replace DTCC? Yep. Will it? I don't know. But I'm willing to make that bet. And I mean, he's a visionary guy. His wife is a great technologist and together they're just a killer team. Um, so that's one that I love and, and we're betting on. I was, honestly, I, I, was, I was pretty high on, on, uh, on BlockFi. I really believed, I really still believe that uh, lending institutions need to exist in CFI to help get savings onto a platform that can then be lent responsibly to create this productive. And everybody's like, no, no, they all, look, what happened wasn't, again, it wasn't a failure of crypto. It wasn't a failure of a fraud. It was a failure of risk management, right? They had too much concentration to two borrowers, fine. Maybe they needed some more adult supervision. You know, they're young, enthusiastic, very talented young people. Maybe they need a little more. I don't know. But but I still believe that that functionality. So I, it's like right now, I believe that a startup lender with a new brand, it could be trusted. Uh, I think would be <laughs> it's like a startup tobacco company. No liabilities for all the people you hurt in the past and huge you know, windfall profits. But I, I wouldn't really do that. Really don't that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it would be a good business. But I do believe maybe a startup lender where you say, look, we're going to we're only going to do lending the right way. We're not going to pay egregious you know, returns. We're going to pay normal NIMS, right? Normal net interest margins. So um, I, I really believe, and I'm, I'm, I got my fingers crossed on this one, you know, we're investors in Gemini and, and I believe, you know, they took the high road on regulation and got all the licenses and, and they didn't overextend and they've managed the business well. They did get caught, unfortunately, with, uh, as they announced yesterday, with the um, Genesis problem, which Genesis goes back to FTX. Ugh, yeah, yeah, this is um, yeah, the contagion. But I do think they have a chance because they can do what CZ did. Remember when CZ had the hack and he put in 40 million bucks of his own money? He said, you're good. And I'm going to create this SAFU fund and I'm going to make everybody whole. And now he's built that up to a billion dollars. And it's kind of like his own FDIC. Yeah. Awesome. And someone as an exchange and Coinbase kind of went down that path two days ago with the Wall Street Journal ad, basically saying, trust us. Mm-hmm. We do this right. We have insurance. We Now, it's not like FDIC insurance, but it. Brian's a good operator. Mm-hmm. You know, some people don't like him, but and, and we're investors in that, too. But so somebody's going to become the trusted exchange because we just saw the untrustworthy exchange blow up. But I, I still think that that business and look, all the maxis that say, no, no, no it's got to be in self-storage. Fine. Ledger, one of our portfolio companies, just had their best sales week ever. And Ledger's going to announce a new product on December 3rd or 5th. I can't remember which day. It's going to blow people away. Blow people away. The guy who designed it literally is the guy that designed the iPod um, that revolutionized music. And, uh, and I believe, and this is just me, the browser created the internet. Mark Andreessen, you know, Netscape, Netscape. Yeah. It, 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 it made the internet available to everyone. It was the conduit, you know, the portal. This made the mobile net. 
available to everyone. Now, what's crazy, in 2007, when this came out, Apple went down 40%. Because people were like, I don't need a smartphone. I got my flip phone and it works totally fine. I'm not going to pay $500 for a phone. You're right. You're going to pay $1,500 for a phone because it's not a phone. It's a supercomputer. And it's connected to 100 billion devices around the world. And the network is very, very, very valuable. So I believe the wallet is that for Web3. I know people don't like that term and, you know, Jack's now calling it Web5 and whatever. Web whatever. The next iteration of the web, I believe the wallet. And, and the question for me, is it this with an enclave that's protected from SIM swaps and all that stuff that supposedly is there, but no one's really said they can make it work? Or is it Ledger and those guys with the HSMs, the hardware security module that is hard tech, but I'm not going to give up my screen I'm not going to give up the five or six things. Like I have, what, 200 apps on here that I touch five every day. But I'm not going to give up those five apps. So it needs to be, and I don't want to carry another thing. Right. I, I really don't. I want to carry one thing. So I need it to do both. And I think someone's going to do that. And whoever does, I think that tech is the, the inflection point for the adoption of this ecosystem yeah, I think I think what you're talking, all the companies that you're discussing, they're all part of an ecosystem. Yeah. Right? The question is not that there's value in providing lo loans to people that would otherwise be charged 20% by a credit card because they can't get it anywhere else. Yep. It's not that you don't need a trading platform in order to be able to exchange things quickly and effectively if you're a hedger or if you own assets and you want to be able to, to transact or if you want to own your own wealth in a safe place where nobody could take it from, yeah. et cetera, yeah, yeah. right? It's always about in a nascent industry, the excesses of any one of those things, right? We need to, it, it kind of, you need to find some harmony between all of them for you to actually create it, that next next thing. And and the, the tech bubble was the excess of the belief. What was it that you called it, Adam? The click, click per, it wasn't about the EBITDA. Market cap per click or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Click, right? yeah, eyeballs. And so this is a kind of a new normal. And then you realize, no, it's not. It has to go back to fundamentals. And it took, what, six, seven years for tech to really build something of, of, that's widely distributed and of use and, and making some money um, before it also became a bubble again, right? So, hey, buddy. Um, right. Before it also became a bubble. Uh, so we're going to get there again. I think I like the, uh, the analogy of the summer and the, and the, the spring, right? And I think we're going to be... It's going to be a few years before this all plays so, out. So, so my big thing, and, and the reason I, you know, he's like, yeah. I, he, it's Friday night magic, so we got to go play. Yeah, magic we got to go gathering too, yeah. tonight. Definitely. Um, so, but he and his cohort are the reason I'm still doing this, and, and the reason we're all thinking about this. They are digital native, complete digital native, and this digital divide is real. Right. And I tell the, the story, I right? ask anyone over 35, who's your broker? Yeah, Merrill Lynch, UBS. How much gold do you have? Three, four percent. How much Bitcoin do you have? Oh, zero. It's a Ponzi scheme. Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How often do you use DeFi? What's DeFi? Ask anyone under 35, particularly, you know, 11 to, to 18. And not, not, this, not maybe not 11, but, you know, ask, ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? W what's a broker? I mean, I have a Robinhood account. How much gold do you have? Oh, are you kidding me? Boomer rocks. Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? Zero. How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Yeah. Big part of my net worth. I'm kind of embarrassed. How often use DeFi every day? 37 trillion from my generation to that generation, from the boomers to the echo boomers. 37 trillion with a T. It ain't staying in the traditional world. It's it's go into the digital world. So all of the infrastructure to facilitate that, the, the replication of financial services in the digital realm is what it's all about. And, and there are so many opportunities and it just goes so far beyond trading lines on a screen and levering up, number go up, illiquid tokens and you know pump and dump 
But if you go back to the history of markets, whether it's a bazaar in the Ottoman Empire, whether it is, you know, the the stock market in the 1920s, whether it's the tech bubble in 2000 or today, it's always the same. Yeah. You know what? My favorite. The bad people come in. They ruin it for everybody else in the short term. But in the long term, it's all okay. Yeah. Out of the ashes, something rises, right? Yeah. Out of the ashes, something. rises. I think my favorite take here is from my buddy here, Dave Natig, who's on the chat. It was my favorite tweet of the week, which was, you know, I keep feeling like I need to have a hot take here, but my, the only thing I can muster is humans, man. Humans gonna human. <laughs> ha! Humans gonna human. Yeah, my, was, my, my hashtag this week has been, you know, bad people do bad things and hashtag, you know, hate the player, don't hate the game. Um, but I think you've done you a really good job man. here at the end bringing some uh, positivity and uh, this future of finance and innovation, which is as good a pitch as anyone can probably do at this point to, to keep people, you know, the skeptics uh, a, a little bit more uh, open to the idea of uh, a revolution and innovation in, in this space. Yeah. And, and, well, and, and I, I appreciate that, Richard. And, and my only subtle change is I always say evolution. I drop the R. To me, this is an evolution of computing that is an, is, is an is as inevitable, it's a tongue twister, as client server to the internet, the internet to the mobile net, the mobile net to the truth net, and displacing trust with truth is what we're all about, right? We have 800 years of relying on trust. We have a trusted third party, middle people extracting rents, to make sure that value is what it is and that the databases tie. Now we have a technology where we have truth. My ownership is on chain and no one can change it. No one can mess with it. It's permanent, immutable. And if I transfer it to you, Richard, it's yours. And we all give a thumbs up and we verify that block, tick tock, we move on. And, and I love Jimmy's song. You want know, you to get really enthusiastic, listen to Jimmy's song talk about what happens about humans, humans, human, the thing humans do incredibly well, maybe not everyone individually, but as, 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 as a humanity, we innovate and we grow and we get better and we learn and investing, right? With every investment, we get richer or wiser, never both, right? Because when we're right, we never analyze, when we're wrong, we analyze a lot. And so if we think about the when Jimmy talks about this, he's like, if you get away from an asset that when it's given to you, it immediately starts to devalue. It makes you think about consumption. If you give someone an asset that at least is flat or has the chance to appreciate, you think about creation and you unlock this unbelievable amount of human potential, like this young woman I was talking to in the car last night. She came from a lousy circumstance, but she's got a mind that's going to do something. And there are so many examples of that all over the world. And that's what's amazing to me. I mean, I'll, I'll leave you one really, really cool thing. So uh, my wife and I uh, copied the scholarship program here at University of North Carolina called the Moorhead Kane Scholars and did a similar thing up at Notre Dame. And we have this partnership with something called the African Leadership Academy. And... It's a school that takes kids who score really high on test scores in all the African countries, brings them to Johannesburg for 13th year, which is like senior year and a gap year, and then gets them placed on scholarship in schools in the U.S. and and the U.K. And so we bring a number of these kids to Notre Dame every year. And we had this kid. He found his brother decapitated. Tribal warfare. Family fled to from Burundi to Rwanda, where he grew up in a. Uh, refugee camp, had the equivalent of three years of formal education, maxed the scores on all the A-levels, okay? Went to ALA, blew, knocked it out of the park. We interviewed him, said, please come to Notre Dame. Comes to Notre Dame, freshman year, all the professors are fighting over this guy, right? Fighting over this guy to bring him in the PhD program. Went back to Africa, 
start a school in Rwanda to find more of him. That can be fueled by all of, of what we're talking about. If we strip out the costs of international finance, like if I send money to Rwanda now, he gets 70 cents on the dollar. If I use the strike app, which we're investors in, he gets a dollar. So I don't mean to over dramatize it, but there is so much promise and so much potential and so much positive. And yeah, all the press is on these bad people. Like we live in a society where the worst things you do, the more popular you become. It's insane. The more sensational you are, for sure, I yeah. am. Insane. Anyway, look, I, yeah. I love having these chats with you guys. You guys are awesome to tolerate my loquaciousness. Oh, no, great energy and insights, Mark. This has been really fun. So thank you so much for your generous offering of your time to 90 Minutes. No, uh, so much fun. So much fun. And uh, yeah. I, I appreciate the, the collaboration and the partnership, and, and we'll do it again soon. Yeah. Thanks, Where can Mark. people find you, Mark? Uh, so at Mark Yusko on Twitter, uh, morgancreekcapcap.com. Um, pretty much stink at email. I'm, I'm decent at DM. Um, I'm really good at text, but I probably won't give out my mobile number to everybody, but probably some people not, have it. Not yet. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty easy to find and I'm, I'm not bad on DM. I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah. We'll have it's you back to talk a little bit man. about traditional finance and your history. There's a lot, a lot there that I think I want to pull on. Awesome. Uh, we'll give it, we'll give it six months and bring you back in. All right. Thanks y'all. Right, Thank thanks you so much. much. Thanks Mark. Thanks, Mark. thanks everyone. everyone that everybody like today. and share. All right. Yep. Thank you. you. Bye. Most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, golden commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, adaptive asset allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let Adaptive Asset Allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit RationalMF.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund.